Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Catacombs. Well, he's done it again. Pope Francis has uh, performed another, um, well, publicity stunt, apparently, with his visit, recent visit to, to Korea, in which he requested, before he actually landed in Korea, he requested that a small car be provided for his transportation rather than any sort of limousine. And so we have this, uh, you know, this sort of odd scene of the Pope getting off an Alitalia jumbo jet and uh, walking down the sort of red carpet and cramming his rather large frame into this very small Kia Soul, this automobile that looks like it was more appropriate for a youngster, a young man to drive. And, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's true, Rob. I mean, I, I don't mean to, to poke fun, but it, it was just an odd spectacle. I, I don't know. I mean, we've seen so many of these things. And my, my, my immediate reaction was, uh, why not let the people of Korea roll out the red carpet for the, for the, for the visiting dignitary? Why not let them do, do it the way they wanted to do it, show them that they, can, that they can pull it off like any other country? It seems almost condescending in a way to say, you know, well, we're coming to your little country. We want one of your little cars. I mean, I'm sure that wasn't intended, but that's, that's just the way it struck me. We've seen, we've seen a lot of this. We saw recently with the Holy Father uh, deciding he was going to have his lunch in a cafeteria with a bunch of workmen inside the Vatican, which is fine. Popes have always, you know, been, been generous and open uh, with the people of the city of Rome and so forth. But what was odd about it is that the whole thing is always, is always documented with cameras, you know, clicking away, and, and then we're supposed to say, gee, uh, isn't the Holy Father humble? Now, here's the thing. Before, before you get too upset for me for being critical, because I, I happen to think that it's a shame and a scandal to ever have to criticize any prince of the church, starting with the Pope, of course, first and foremost. But when these things happen and scandal follows, uh, I guess thinking Catholics have to sort of look a little more uh, intelligently at what's going on and say, well, in fact, what is going on? And here's my theory. Maybe you're not going to agree, maybe you will. But my theory is that a lot of this actually isn't Pope Francis. So. I'll extend the olive branch to those who say he's, he's the most misunderstood pope in history. Maybe it's not Pope Francis that's responsible for this. Because let's remember, back in 2012, now before uh, Pope Francis came along, uh, we had this, 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 this event in which the Vatican decided to sort of rebrand re itself by hiring PR firms and some, some highfalutin, high buck firms to come in and sort of refashion the Vatican in a way that would be more palatable to the world and to sort of undo some of the scandalous bad press that they had had at the Vatican for a long time. And so they hired some pretty big firms to accomplish this. And one of the, one of the fellows who's responsible for that is a guy by the name of Greg Burke. Now Greg, this again, to, to take this away from the personal Pope Francis thing, Greg Burke was, one of his first things was to get the first, to, to bring about the first tweeting Pope in the history of the, of the papacy. And Benedict XVI, I think, was of course the first Pope to send a tweet. And this was supposed to make him more, uh, I don't know what, what, what do you think? Approachable? Approachable, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they're doing over there, but that's apparently what the thing was. So I, I would like tonight to talk a little bit about Greg Burke, all right? I, maybe we can get a picture of Greg up on the screen. I don't know. And to put a different face on this other than Pope Francis, because these things that keep happening seem to me to be publicity stunts. They seem to be designed to say, aha, we finally have a man of the people. Now, what does that say, Bob? Isn't that just drawing attention to one pope, comparing him to all the 260 some odd popes that preceded him, finally we have a pope who gets it, who is humble, who isn't this arrogant aristocratic jerk that no one could, could, could relate to. Uh, it just seems to be pulling the papacy down to the level of the people as though we're all going to be thrilled with this. Well, a bunch of us aren't thrilled. A bunch of us are kind of wondering if that's really going to accomplish anything other than to convince the world the, the, the Christophobic, Catholic-hating world, by the way, that finally the church realizes that she's not superior to all other religions, that in fact she's uh, gotten over herself, and the Pope is the first to be out there representing this new idea that the Catholic Church has gotten over itself. So we can all maybe find some common ground in looking at this guy, Greg Burke, who is considered a PR genius and who helped to make Pope Francis, quote-unquote, popular, the Pope, the humble Pope that the media who on all other fronts loathes everything to do with church teaching on gay marriage and abortion and contraception and everything else, but for some reason cannot possibly get enough of the new Pope humble. Is this Pope Francis' fault? I would argue that perhaps it is not, other than he's going along with it. But Pope Benedict went along with some of it as well. As I say, he's the first tweeting Pope 
or whatever that accomplished. So we have Francis's marketing mastermind, who is an ex-US journalist. He was a member of Opus Dei as well. He's 53 years old. We'll put a face to him. He's a senior media, advi media advisor to the Vatican. He used to work for Fox News and was hired by the Vatican in June of 2012. He's born in Missouri. He, again, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is a, a fellow, a gentleman that we can point to. And uh, he, joined, he joined the Vatican team. Now, he, the tiny car, the black shoes, uh, moving out of the papal apartments, all of these things that we're seeing, eating in cafeterias, driving around in Kia Souls, uh, wearing fireman helmets, helmets, whatever it is, all of this is part of Burke, Greg Burke's vision of the papacy. And it's not a vision that millions of Catholics are used to. It's something new. He's creating this impression that the Pope is now going to come down off his throne and go slumming with us. Now maybe he has good intentions, I don't know. But the impression many of us have is that the media helped to uncrown Christ the King. They threw him out. He no longer matters or is even acknowledged. So now it's time to uncrown his vicar on earth, the Holy Father in Rome. Now this gentleman, Greg Burke, reports directly to the Vatican's Deputy Secretary of State, Archbishop Angelo Bucci, the third ranking person in the, in the Vatican hierarchy, whose position might be compared roughly to that of a White House Chief of Staff. He reports directly to the Cardinal Secretary of State on a daily basis. So I would ask you to consider the fact that we now ha are in a situation in which the Vatican is in the hands of political strategists who think they know better and who think they can create and craft a pope for the people. <laughs> I don't know, Rob, is that something you're comfortable well, with? No, but to be fair, the guy might be a genius. He probably is a genius. Because it has worked. But, but it's not the, a good thing. It, it's it working. Happened. You're right. You're right. The media love him and, and the, the folks supposedly love him. But I don't know. I think there's always been this, this sense, uh, the fact that the, the papacy, that the pope was elevated, that he wore the shoes of the fisherman, the tiara, and all of these things. He ascended a throne, not because he was arrogant, but because this is the, the, the dignity of his office that, he, that, that it deserves. So Pope Pius X, for example, was also not comfortable with, with uh, some of the trappings of the royal papacy. But he subjected himself to it anyway because of his respect for the church and for the ruling authority of the church. And I don't know, we've always had this idea, the people, us, the little people, that the Holy Father in Rome is a mediator between us and, and the Godhead, and Almighty God. I don't necessarily think that pulling the Pope from his throne is going to accomplish anything. And it doesn't, the superstar Pope doesn't seem to have accomplished anything to speak of so far, other than the world that is trying desperately to throw and cast aside the church's moral teaching and moral authority, now loves this new recrafted image of the Pope that is done by a person, by teams of people who are used to working for politicians to recast them in a way that's going to be palatable for re-election. This is not what the Pope has ever been about. The office of the papacy has never been about anything like this. So I think we're at least, we're at least within the realm of, of, of legitimate debate to suggest that this idea to, to recast the papacy in the image and likeness of the world is a massive mistake. Um, and this takes it away from criticizing Pope Francis himself directly or Pope Benedict or whoever, whichever pope subjects himself to this, to this sort of politicizing of, 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 the, of the papacy. And, I, and, and it's on those grounds that we're looking at some of these things which seem like obvious stunts, obvious media-driven stunts or media-pleasing political stunts and to say, what is going on with the papacy? What is going on with Pope Francis? And it's on those grounds that we believe we have an obligation to raise our, our, our voices in question, to say quo vadis to, to Peter, and to say what is going on. So in light of all this, we have right now on the Remnant website a Stop the Synod petition, and we're referring to the Synod on the Families petition, uh, or the, the upcoming Synod in October. We're, trying to, we're not trying to actually stop the synod. We don't have grandiose aspirations that the little remnant is able to stop the synod. But we're trying to make a provocation. And so far, as of this morning, we had 13,000 people who signed on to, in support and viewed that, that petition. And uh, the problem that we see is part of the recrafting of the papacy, the Greg Burke and, and these PR firms that are involved with the Vatican now, 
Part of the problem with a synod is that it's, it's, it's part of the same, the same general uh, agenda. Let's make the Catholic Church more palatable. If you're divorced and remarried, we're going to come up with a pastoral solution. Well, here's the problem with that. There is no pastoral solution to that. This comes from the lips of our Lord himself. What, what man has joined together, let no man put asunder. There's nothing we can do about that. We can have compassion for those who give themselves involved in, in marriages that fail. But the church has always had compassion for those who are in that situation. She's always had, she's always allowed for, the, for a separation, for example, if a wife is being abused by a husband or, or, and so forth. But the idea of then being able to remarry and act as though marriage is not permanent, is not an indissoluble bond, this is, this, this, is a, this is a novel modernist concept that now we see working its way into the church under the auspices of Cardinal Walter Casper, but with the apparent blessing of the Holy Father. Now we're all waiting to see what's going to happen, but the reason we're opposing this synod on the family is because there is no pastoral solution. You can't do anything about this. If people are living in a state of adultery, they can't simply decide, well, let's be nice and allow them to go to the sac receive the sacraments. It just simply does not work that way. So we can say, as loyal sons of the church, that this synod, if that's their intention, and that's what they've stated that it is their intention, to find pastoral solutions to this problem, we can say, as loyal sons of the church, this is doomed to failure. It's doomed to be another scandal. So what we're trying to do at remnantnewspaper.com is raise aware awareness, especially in the court of public opinion, that there are thousands and thousands, if not millions of Catholics who are looking to Rome right now and saying, don't do this, don't let this happen, do not scandalize us again. The church has to occupy the high moral ground. She cannot possibly come down and through the pol politics of appeasement be palatable to the world. The world is always going to hate the church because the church is the moral authority, the moral voice of God himself. And, and that moral authority sometimes, oftentimes in fact, has difficult restrictions and prohibitions in order for us to continue to live a moral life. So please go to our website, and this, this is ongoing, this whole discussion of Pope Francis. We're trying to be as respectful as we possibly can. We certainly do not enjoy criticizing the Pope, but when we see these outside, outside sort of political forces moving in on the Vatican, on our beloved church, we have a right to raise our voices of concern, and that's exactly what we're doing. So please go to our website, remnantnewspaper.com, sign this synod uh, petition, stop the, peti stop the synod petition, and let's see if we can't uh, do something to, to slow down this, this progressivist uh, you know, sort of juggernaut that has now, the under the auspices of supposedly of Pope Francis, is moving in a very dangerous direction. Uh, on a lighter note, please uh, be aware of the Catholic Identity Conference 2014, which is coming up in the middle of September, September 12th, 13th, and 14th. This is a really, really impressive project that's going on. In fact, it's called the Catholic Identity Project. And what it's all about is trying to bring traditionalists together on, on a lot of these issues so we can have constructive discussions and debates with people who maybe don't agree with us on everything, but agree on the biggies, on the big issues, that we need to do something to raise some sort of concerted protest and resistance to the anti-Catholic, Christophobic forces that are at work vigilantly every day in the world in which we live. So please, uh, this is called the Catholic Identity Conference. The theme this year is the old evangelization, restoring liturgy, mission, and Catholic tradition. It'll be held in the Weirton, West Virginia Holiday Inn. There's a telephone number we'll have at the bottom of the screen. You can call right away and reserve your spot because the seats are, are going up or disappearing rapidly or however you say that. The website is catholicidentity2012.com. Please visit that. You can also register right online as well. And this is a really exciting thing that they're doing. They're, they're, they're trying to get beyond the circular firing squad that, alas, has come to typify traditional Catholicism. So they've got an impressive array of speakers from a really wide variety of traditionalist and just regular Catholic, conservative Catholic camps. Uh, Rorate Celi will be there. The Angelus will be there. The Remnant will be there. Catholic Family News. Uh, Chris Ferrara of Catholic Family Lawyers will be there. Dr. John Rao of the Roman Forum. Louis Verecchio of Harvesting the Fruits. Uh, and the, the newcomer that everyone's excited about, Brendan Michael Daugherty, will be there. So please support this effort. There's a lot of complaining that we don't seem to be getting anywhere in the present milieu and that we need to do something. Well, this organization is doing something. They're bringing people together to say, hey, if you're in the fraternity, if you're in the Society of St. Pius X, you're going to diocesan, traditional masses, whatever, 
come and let's have conversations. Let's have discussions. Let's not ostracize. Let's not bomb throw. Let's try to get together with people who can say the creed, people who recognize the importance of the traditional Latin mass, people who recognize the importance of homeschooling and small Catholic education, alternatives to public schools and so forth. This is an endeavor that needs to be supported. So please come, bring the kids, bring the family. This is an important conference. If you can't come, go to their website anyway and find out how you can financially support Mr. Eric Frankovich, who is a successful businessman in the area. And he simply has been following traditional Catholicism for years. And he's saying, hey, why aren't we getting further? Why aren't we doing more to bring people together? Why are we always spending so much time sort of nitpicking and, and crepe hanging over the various traditionalist camps. Why don't we move beyond that and fight the real baddies, an endeavor that here at the Remnant Underground we support 250,000%. So please, Catholic Identity Conference coming right up. Time is running short. Look it up, sign up, and come and join us for a really, really important piece of Catholic action. There was something else. Oh, uh, tell them about the uh, letters. Oh, yes, letters from the catacomb. We've had a lot of requests lately for, uh, for the for Remnant Underground to supply some answers to a lot of questions that people have. So we're receiving email questions, letters through the mail. And so we decided to introduce a new segment down here called Letters from the Catacombs. We want you to send us those questions to, I, I think we'll probably use the, the Remnant Newspaper's email accounts at this point, admin at remnantnewspaper.com will work, or send us through the regular snail mail to uh, Letters from the Catacomb, P.O. Box 1117. Forest Lake, Minnesota, 55023. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to provide a, a little segment at the end of our programs to answer these questions. If we don't have the answers here, we will find someone who does, and we will provide a service at the end of each uh, Remnant Underground that will answer some questions that are nagging a lot of people out there uh, with respect to how do we proceed, how do we go from here to continue this counter-revolution in the name of the traditional masters from Catholicism and the reign of Christ the King. Uh, over and above that, the usual, please follow us on, what, how does it go? Follow us on Facebook, right? Uh, like us, well, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter for some reason, I'm not sure, but that's what we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and for all of the, uh, you know, the, the headline, latest headlines and all the articles on all these different topics that we, we, that we, we treat down here, please visit our website every day, remnantnewspaper.com. It's pretty much updated on the hour, so there's a lot of great stuff there, remnantnewspaper.com, support us and we'll continue this, this fight for Catholic restoration. We've not given up, we know you haven't given up, so please help us, support us, and uh, pray for us, and we're gonna continue the fight, and this is a great way, a tangible way that you can help us. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you down here next week.